Turn to your neighbor and say, it's already provided. And as you're having your seat, turn to your other neighbor and say, it's already provided. So in looking at this, um, this series is called One Prayer. And so when I uh, got the invitation for Pastor Stephen and he said, if there was one prayer that you could have for the church, what would that be? And my one prayer was that you would believe, see, and live from the truth that all things are provided to you for life and godliness. Again, my one prayer, what we're going to talk about today is for you to believe, to see, and live from the truth that all things are provided for you in life and godliness. Now, that is a, a meaty uh, subject, so we're going to start off talking about the last part where it says all things are provided for you. So the context for the scripture that we read in 2 Peter is the apostle Peter is in his last years of his life. And he's thinking about what is the message that I want to share? What is it that I want to leave behind to the church? You know, Peter is, is probably uh, most people's favorite disciple. You know, Peter, Peter's like that, that fun slash crazy uncle that we all have where like, you know, Peter went from being with Jesus to cussing out somebody, to cutting off somebody's ear, to being used by God. He was just everywhere. He, he, was, he, he was there. He, w- he would say the right thing and two steps later say the wrong thing. Like, he, like that was Peter. Uh, and, and Peter had a moment where Jesus said, you're going to deny me. He said, no, I won't. He said, yes, you will. He said, no, I won't. Fast forward, he denies him. Then Jesus comes back, Jesus dies and raised from the grave, and he comes back and he says, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, I love you. He said, well, feed my sheep. Then he said to him again, Peter, do you love me? Like, yeah, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Then the third time, you know, Peter, you know, the Lord's still working on Peter. So he asked him again, do you love me? And Peter's like, yeah. And the Bible says Peter got a little, a little irritated. He's like, yes, you know I love you. Then he said, feed my sheep. I'm pretty sure as he was writing this letter, he had that thought in mind, that before I leave the earth, I want to be sure that I accomplish the task that Jesus gave me. He said for me to feed his sheep. He said for me to share. So so in this passage that we just read, it's Peter's last writing. It's his last opportunity to feed the sheep. It's his last opportunity to share from his experiences, because after all, Peter walked with Jesus. Like Jesus had the 70, then he had the 12, then he had the three. And Peter was involved in the three. There was stuff that Peter saw that only James and John saw. And so in looking at this, we're hearing from someone who is not talking about from a third or fourth person removed. We're talking about somebody who walked with Jesus, who ate with him, who talked with him, who saw when he was up and and saw when he was still up. I don't know if Jesus can be down. So (laughs) saw when he was up and up. And so as, as he's thinking about what can I say, he steps back and kind of surveys the scene. And what was happening at that time is that the church had seen some progress and they were making moves and, and they kind of got to a point to where they felt like they were stuck. They, they felt like, like what I'm doing, I'm seeing a certain degree of results, but then there are people coming, coming to me from the right and the left and, and people are questioning their faith and questioning Should this be or should this not be? And should I go to the right or should I go to the left? Do I believe God? Do I not believe God? What do I do? There were all of these questions. Do I believe in Jesus? And if so, how much do I believe in Jesus? I can trust him in this area, but can I trust him in that area? And just this constant tug of war, this constant go back and forth, kind of like today. Who do I vote for? Who do I not vote for? What is God calling me to do? Is there a spouse? What does he want from me? All of these We'll call them questions. There's an image that I have. I know I want to be married. I know I want this job. I know I want the impact. I know I want this end result. But how do I get there? What what is the route that I need to take to accomplish that which I know in my heart I'm supposed to have? But there are so many different things pulling me to the right and the left and so many different pathways. What do I do? And at the introduction of his letter, he reminds them 
that God has provided all things. All things means all things. There's nothing not included in all things. When, when God says all, he means all. And he says all things for life and godliness. Again, let's talk about Peter's history. Peter was there when the 5,000 men, not including women and children, were hungry. And Jesus fed them. He was there when there were 4,000 and he fed them. He was there where the woman went to get something to drink. And he said, I'll give you a drink that you'll never thirst again. He was there when God provided things for life. He was there when he restored hope, when he were restored a purpose, when he restored a destiny. He was there. But he also saw godliness. He saw him lay hands on the sick and they recover. He saw people who were tormented and, and, and afflicted, which we're going to talk about later, and saw them be set free. So when Peter said, God will provide all things, he wasn't talking about a good idea. He's saying, I've seen it happen. And the very thing that I've seen happen, God wants it for you. God has provided everything that you need for life and godliness. So I was sitting here thinking, how can I convey this point that we're going to build off of? And so I was in town, and my wonderful brother and friend, Stephen and Zai, had a little baby, Zoe. So I've already professed that, that I'm going to be Zoe's favorite uncle. <laughs> and so in that moment, you know, she was sitting there, and she was asleep, and she started twirling around, and I said, all right, this is my moment. She's going to wake up, and she's going to see me, and it's going to be like, that's my favorite uncle. I'm going to take you to Disney World. I live in Florida. Disney World. I got beaches. Like, I'm going to be the man. <laughs> so she starts to twirl, and she has a little pacifier, and she spits it out. I put it back in. She spits it out. I put it back in. And then she's moving her fingers, so I say, oh, I'll put my hand there. She grabs my hand. She opens her eyes. Big smile. <laughs> she starts crying. Well, I still believe I'm her favorite uncle, but I didn't have what she needed. She was hungry. <laughs> Past the side, she needs you. She was looking for something that I could not provide. I wanted to be that for her, but I couldn't. And a lot of times in life, we find ourselves trying to find solutions in a place they can't provide the solutions we need. We find ourselves trying to go a route that's just not going to work. And so Peter is saying, hey, God's already provided all things. Don't try to seek it from your parents. Don't try to seek it from a spouse, from a relationship, from a job. God has provided all things. It reminded me of a story. My youngest brother is 10 years younger than me, and, and he decided he wanted to put together a puzzle. He was about seven. I said, are you sure? He said, yes. I said, all right, go for it. You need help? No, I'm good. All right, cool. I come back 10 minutes later. He said, I, I quit. I'm done. I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, something's missing. Some, some pieces aren't here. I said, well, um, when I bought the puzzle for you, it was sealed. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure all the pieces, nope, nope, something's wrong. I said, uh, it was brand new. So I'm pretty sure, nope, nope, the pieces aren't in there. I said, it sounds like it's a user error. <laughs> Have you ever put together a puzzle before? He said, no. I said, okay, let me help you out. This is the way you go about putting together a puzzle. You start off with a corner piece because they're, you know, the corner piece is already counted. Two sizes is dealt with for you already, so you only got to try to pat, match two more. And then you take the image that's in front of you, and you get this image. And what puzzle pieces do I have to put in place to put together this image? So I told him, get the image. Sorry for you Orioles fan. You know, this is the only puzzle I can find. Sorry. <laughs> but get the image. Get the image. Get it in your mind. And then see what pieces do you need to put in place to first start with the border and start putting together the border, and you'll see the picture starts to come together. And next, I got to do the crowd. So what are the crowd pieces that I can put in place? And then what are these pieces? Because everything you need is already provided. 
So shift your focus from trying to find more pieces and figure out how to use what's already provided for you. And so it's like that for us. We're in this season of fasting and prayer, and we believe in God. We're crying out. We God, God, there's an image. There is something that I know that you have for me. And I got these pieces. What do I do with them? But what must be settled is that God has given you all the pieces that you need. Everything that you need has already been provided. So stop focusing on not having something and start focusing on how do I get access to that which is already provided. And so I was talking to my brother Patrick yesterday. like, hey, you know, he's like, what you preaching on? Oh, man, it's going to be good. It's already provided. He said, oh, okay, what? I said, whatever you need. <laughs> whatever I need is provided, it's already provided. How do I get it? That's what I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow. <laughs> so that was the introduction, and we're going to now talk about how do I access that which is already provided. So if you could turn your attention to Mark chapter 9. So to kind of give you a little bit of background, um, Jesus and his, his three are coming down from the mountain. They just had the mountain of transfiguration. They come down, and there's this, this big commotion going on. And Jesus is like, hey, so uh, what's going on? And this father cries out, and he says, my son is tormented. I'm giving you the abbreviated Rashad version type of deal. My son is tormented. Oh, they have the scripture up for me, so let's, let's read it. All right. So 21, it says, and he asked the father, how long has it been since he has been tormented? And the father said, from childhood, it has been often thrown him into both the fire, the water, destroying him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus, in a way that only Jesus can respond, said, if I can, <laughs> all things are possible to him that believe. So, like, I picture this. I mean, like, you know, I'm pretty sure it was a, a very serious moment because, I mean, his, his son has been going through literally hell on earth. But I picture Jesus kind of like one of those memes, you know, like you've seen, I've seen one for President Obama, for Hillary Clinton, for Trump, for, for Russell Westbrook where someone makes a statement and they like, <laughs> and, I, and I feel like that's what Jesus did. He's like, hey, listen, if you can, he's like, if I can, you know who I am? The question is not if I can, all things are possible to him that believes. So the way I say it is the question is not if I can. The question is do you believe? So the first point and the first way that you are going to access that which is already provided for you is to receive by believing. That's why the first part of my prayer is for you to believe. Believe is defined in many different places as placing confidence in the truth. So in essence, Jesus is saying all things are possible to him that will place confidence in the truth. All things are possible to him that will place confidence in the truth. So now we want to take this subject of believing because the question becomes whatever the image that you have, do you believe? Like, do you really, really, really believe? In looking at 2 Peter 1 and 2, we're going to extract some subpoints on what's important in looking at this aspect of believing. We see here at verse 2 where it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus our Lord. So the first aspect is you have to acknowledge the fact that he is Lord. Not just Lord over your life, but Lord in that particular situation. Let's be real. You know, it's, it's, it's just me and you talking here. We've all had times where, like, God, I believe you for like 95% of things. But, but this over here, I'm not really ready to give that up. I mean, you know, I, I want you to change and transform my finances, but I'm, I'm not really ready to, to, like, do what you say do in the book. So here we see it's important for him not just to be Lord over your life because he is gracious and, and you know, 
We like Peter. We're a work in progress, you know. He's not saying be perfect, but in that particular situation that you want him to move in, he must be Lord. Lord is nothing more than you are humbly submitting to his authority. It's just purely saying you know better than I know. So I'm not going to try to do your will my way. You have a way that's going to work out, and so I'm going to submit to your way. So if you're looking to, to access it and, and you want to make sure that you're believing, the first thing is whatever this image is, whatever the image is in front of you, you got to believe that the person who made the puzzle actually put all the pieces in there. If you don't believe that, you, you won't make any progress. So the first part is acknowledging the fact of his lordship. Moving on to verse number three, it says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. The next thing I want to focus on is his divine power. You have to also believe in his ability to give. It makes no sense to try to receive something from somebody who don't have the ability to give it to you. It's like if my wife was like, hey, I want you to give me a child. I really, really love you, and I really, really, really want to, I can't do it. It, it ain't going to happen. Right? It, and so if I'm going to believe for something, I have to believe in the, the person's ability to actually give it. And so in looking at this area, whatever your image is, have you submitted to his plan, and then do you believe that he really wants to give it to you? Like, like do, do I really believe that this is what he wants. And that leads to the next part. And looking at verse 4, it says, For these things he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that you may become partakers of his divine nature. And so earlier in verse 3, he used the word that we've been called. There was a plan and a purpose, and God has called you to something. And whatever you're believing God for, he has called you to accomplish that. There was a dream, there was a purpose, there was a vision on the inside of you, and you have to settle the fact that he actually wants it. He wants you to impact your family. He wants you to in impact a generation. He wants you to be married. The Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. The Bible says be fruitful and multiply. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's, it's, it's very clear that he wants that, but you got to settle that. If you don't settle that, that he wants you to have it, there's still the wrestle. The way to stop the wrestle is to settle. Listen, I believe. And because I believe, I believe that he is Lord. He has a way, and I'm doing his way. I believe in the fact that he has the ability to give me what I want, and I believe thirdly that he wants me to have it. Amen? So looking at this, this is what we saw going back to Mark. This is what we saw in the father. The father had been dealing with his son who has been going through some turmoil and, and, and going through affliction that he shouldn't be going through. And he recognized that Jesus had the ability to heal him. He went to him and was like, listen, I, I need some help. Can you come and heal? And so Jesus said, going back to verse 23, if you can, all things are possible to him that believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. But help my unbelief. That don't make any sense, does it? I do believe. But help my unbelief. It's, it's oftentimes, point number one is to receive by believing. Often what you'll find is when you receive a truth, you automatically see the disparity between the truth and where you are. What happened there was he believed and accepted the truth that God had for him, and he saw, wait, there's some areas I don't measure up. So I believe, but hey, over here, can you help my unbelief? Now, mind you, he had reason to, unbelie to have unbelief. If we go back to what happened before, he came looking for Jesus. Jesus wasn't there. The disciples said, we can set your son free. They prayed, they did whatever they did, there was no results. It's very possible that you have unbelief, and it's justified unbelief. If it's concerning a certain type of career, 
You've had interview after interview after interview after interview and saw no results. Perhaps you're believing God for a child, and it says that I want you to be fruitful and multiply, and we tried, and we had a miscarriage. Perhaps it's I was in a relationship, and I thought he was the one. We were engaged, and he turned his back. Perhaps she cheated on you. These are very, very real problems and situations and circumstances. They're big, but they're not bigger than God. So in acknowledging the disparity, you will never deal with what you don't confront. A lot of times what happens is we try to pretend like it's not there. We try to pretend like I'm not hurt, I'm not disappointed, I'm not upset, I'm not mad. We try to pretend like Jesus don't know what's really going on. Think about it. If you're a father and your son's going through this and you build up the courage to go have him set free and nothing happens, I'll be upset too. Right? But we see here what the father did. He didn't ignore it. He said, help my unbelief. So in looking at point number two, what we have to do is repent concerning unbelief. We must repent concerning unbelief. Repentance is a word that's, you know, sometimes hard to understand. I'm going to make it very simple for you. It simply means to change your mind. It, I mean, that's simply what it means. It's, now, it's not forgiving. Forgiving, now, you can ask for forgiveness and repent. But just because you ask for forgiveness doesn't mean you've repented. It's like when a child goes and messes something up, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, can you forgive me? You say, yes, and they go do it again. Well, that, that's not repentance. Repentance means to literally change your mind or to change the direction. It's almost as though you were going this way, oh, this is the wrong way, and I go the opposite way. So in this area concerning unbelief, as I mentioned, I mentioned some very, very real issues some real problems that can cause me to have unbelief. And Jesus is aware of those. All he's saying is give them to me. That in the midst of that turmoil and that heartbreak and those situations, I am still Lord, I am still God, and I have good things for you. If you give it to me, I will set you free. I will heal your heart. I will take care of that situation. So the first part is you must acknowledge the dis disparity. You must acknowledge the difference. It's like, hey, I need to be a 10, and I'm really a 5. Help. Right? God, God is not expecting us to be perfect. We try to be perfect. We can't be perfect. So what this father did, he said, listen, I believe, but there's some parts I don't believe. So can you help a brother out? We're willing to ask friends for help and willing to ask colleagues for help, but are we really willing to ask God for help? After all, he is the only one who can really help you. What is it that causes us to not want to ask God for help? And what we saw here, the father was humble enough. He was, he was, was willing to say, hey, listen, I need your help. And so if you're going to walk into what God has already provided for you, you must be willing to acknowledge the difference, be willing to say, hey, listen, I need some help. And then what happened, he was healed. The boy's son was healed. And what you saw in situations like this over and over and over again, Jesus would say, go forth and sin no more. Or, or, or go a different direction. That leads to the last part of repentance is you have to be transformed. When you encounter Jesus, it's not just for the purpose of having chills or goosebumps. It's not just for the purpose of having a moment. He touches your life to change your life. The purpose of God is not just for you to be like a, like a presence junkie, like, I, I got to come for the presence. Oh, I'm wore out. I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Okay, come on. Presence. Oh, man, woe is me. Oh, you know, can't serve today, you know. I, I, I ain't had my presence feel yet. I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to step on nobody's toes. But... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't in my notes. So anyway, so it's important that we're uh, transformed. One of the, the most popular scriptures concerning this is, is Romans 12. 
And it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you will present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, perfect, acceptable will of the Lord. So pretty much he's saying, don't be conformed, but be transformed so that you may prove the will of God. Don't be conformed, but be transformed so you may prove the will of God. What you're believing God for, if it's in line with Scripture, it's the will of God for your life. How do I access it? That I don't be conformed, but I be transformed. A lot of times uh, in being conformed, we think about it in terms of living for God and not living for God. So I'm not going to act a fool because acting a fool is being conformed. But there is, it's possible for us to be conforming in church. It's possible for us to come in and go through the motions and do what I'm supposed to do, but he's really not touching my heart. It's possible to just go through because I know if I smile and act like everything's okay, then they're going to leave me alone. And really, I'm not changed on the inside. And this scripture is saying, be transformed. The way that you're transformed is by renewing your mind. It's literally just saying, change the way you're thinking. When Jesus, his first public message was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's just saying, hey, listen, I'm here. My reign and my rule and my authority are here. Change the way you think. The way you're trying to approach it is not going to work. I have a new way. So it is important for us to recognize in this process of of dealing with the unbelief, the only way we're going to deal with it is to actually renew our mind, allow God to, to, to transform us. When you encounter God, so let's say this situation, you encounter God and he heals you, it's not just for that moment, but it's for him to change the whole perspective about how you view healing. When you're believing God financially for something to happen and you have not been the best steward of your finances, can we be real? I've not been the best steward of my finances. And I say, God, I need help. And God comes in and gives you help. It's not for the purpose of you continuing to be a bad steward. You, you cannot mistake grace for a moment or for a season as grace for a lifetime. God is a good God, and he will be gracious to you, but you still got to do what you know to do. And, and we cannot, we got to stop conforming. If we're going to truly be changed, if we're going to truly see the results that's going to cause us to change our life and change the world, we have to be willing to allow God to transform us from the inside out. And so the way this happens is by being transformed. You got work that you have to do. God, God is not just like, hey, Jenny on a bottle. Hey, six times. I've been bad again. Come through. Because God is gracious. What you don't want to do is abuse the grace. What you don't want to do, he, he, he paid the rent. He, he took care of that. He covered you when, when you did something ungodly. And he covered you for the purpose of you being transformed. Like Jesus, he'll come and say, I'll heal you. Go forth and don't sin no more. So whatever the grace covers, it's not for the purpose for you to live there. It's for the purpose of you to get in the presence and say, God, I need your help. Help me. Change me. Transform me. And so we must be willing. If we're going to access that which is provided for us, we must be willing to be transformed. We must be willing to change your mind and say, listen, you're Lord, you're God, you're Savior, you got a way of thinking, and I'm not thinking that way. Help a brother out. God's not expecting perfection, but he's expecting progress. Say it again. God's not expecting perfection, but he is perfecting, I mean, expecting progress. Amen? All right. Y'all good? Y'all see why Pastor Damon called it a strong word? <laughs> all right, so if, if we're going to access all that's already provided for us, remember, my prayer was for you to believe. Then it was for you to see. The way you see is by changing your mind. We see the world not based off how we see the world, but it's how we see the world. So I want you to see the reality that God has provided all things. The way you see the reality is just repent. Whatever you see differently. 
take an area of your life, what does God say? Oh, okay, let's fix that. Let's change that. That's all you got to do, all right? Y'all good? Take a deep breath. <gasps> all right, so the second part, um, I'm going to go to Second Peter. So in looking at that, we talked about you being able to believe. We talked about you being able to see. The last part of my prayer was so that you can live from that place. It's no point in believing something and seeing something and you can't access it. So in looking at this, I want to go back to our scripture in 2 Peter, and I'm going to point out a word that's used twice. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. I don't know what happened to me. There we go. In the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and excellence, for he has granted us precious promises And I'm sorry, precious and magnificent promises so that we may be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There were two parts there. I believe it was two and three where he said the knowledge of him. He said it twice, that you can access this through the knowledge of him. When he talks about accessing it through the knowledge of him, I want to bounce back real quick to Mark. And looking at Mark, after the man was healed, you go down to verse 28 and 29. The disciples are like, hey, so what just happened? Because, you know, the, the boy came to us. We tried, and we didn't see any results. You came down like the hero and, you know, saying, y'all ain't got no faith. Leave, and, and, and he's gone. And Jesus said this kind comes out by prayer and fasting or prayer depending on the translation. But understand, the disciples had seen it happen before. They'd laid hands on the sick. They'd casted out devils. So what was different? What was different in this situation where they could not access what was provided and the other situation where they could? Looking back at 2 Peter, that's the key. It says it's through the knowledge of him. And looking at the fasting and praying and looking at the knowledge, it's not talking about a head knowledge. It's not talking about your ability to quote scriptures, but it's talking about to know in an intimate way. It's, it's, it's talking about a relationship. What Jesus was saying to them is, is for you to deal with this, you got to go deeper. Where you are was fine for what you want, but for you to go and have th- this next level of power, you got to be willing to go deeper. That leads us to point number three. In order for you to access what's already provided, you must not only have a relationship, you must remain in a relationship with God. It is necessary for you to remain in a relationship with God. You must remain in a relationship with God by doing first what he talked about was prayer. That's just simply communication. Simply communication. If you're going to see this happen, you have to remain in communication with God. Communication, oftentimes, yes, prayer, there are moments where I bow down and I say, God, come into my heart, do this, do that. Yes, that's a part of it. But that, there's also a part where I'm like, hey, God, you know, I've been thinking about this thing, and how, how do you view about this? You know what? This, this feeling keeps coming up. Is that you, God? It's times where I'm just thinking about his scripture, just thinking about his word. The, the same way that you want to text Bay all the time, about nothing? What you doing? Nothing what you doing. Think about you? Oh, I'm thinking about you too. You want to think about her. You're lying. <laughs> but that's <laughs> but that that same type of communication. It's it's not it's not always a serious talk. Think about it. What if whoever you know, every time they talk, it was a serious talk. It was weighty. It was like, man, can I breathe? You're not going to want to talk to him. So every time you talk to God, can I, can I be, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Forgive feel me. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's good. You need that. But you also need relationship. Like, 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 do you really know him? I mean, it's, it's, it's good. I'm, I'm glad you come to church and you worship. But when you're at home. When you have a choice to listen to one type of music or another type of music, 
would you do it? Not because someone tells me I can or I can't, but it's, you know what? I miss you. I just, I just want to feel your presence. I just want to take time and just thank you for what you've done for me. I just want to take time and just commune with you. Just walk with you. Just talk with you. Just, just say what's going on. That's, that's the importance of, of this time of prayer and fasting is that prayer and fasting in and of themselves do nothing. Okay? They are nothing more than vehicles. You can pray all day and see nothing happen. You can fast all day and see nothing happen. But they are vehicles that put us in the presence of God so that he can change us. And so in looking at this, you must remain in relationship through communion, not, not for the point of saying, hey, I read my Bible reading plan. You know, I'm on, I'm on this Bible thing, and I follow a couple people, man, and sometimes, like, Dewana make me feel like I'm not saved. I mean, Dewana every day, day 245, day 246. I'm like, man, I got to read my Bible. I'm not reading my Bible enough. <laughs> Love you, Dewana. But <laughs> so that's good. But studying the word of God is a vehicle. You read the word so that I'm changed. You read the word so that, that I encounter him, that I know him in an intimate way. It says I can access these things through the knowledge of him. It's, it's as though there's a doorway. And you can try to access it different ways, but the only way that you're going to access it to everything is through the knowledge of him. So on the other side of, of what you're looking at believing God for, it's there. Everything is provided. But the way that you're going to live in that place is through relationship. And looking at relationship, the other aspect, there is communication, there is communion, and then there is the aspect of just commitment. Some things are not going to go the way you want them to go. Give me a 30-second soapbox. I'm so tired of Christians whining and complaining because what they wanted to happen didn't happen. The Bible says all things will work out for your good. He didn't say everything you want is going to happen. So you have to be committed. There are going to be times. Listen, listen. There are times I love my wife. Like, I love my wife. Like, like I'm like, God, I pray for these things, and you gave me these extra things. Like, thank you. <laughs> like, oh, you love me. Won't he do it? So that's <laughs> So I love my wife, and we don't have big blow-up conversations, but we have serious conversations. But there is never a thought for me saying, because of this conversation, I'm done with you. Why? Because I'm committed. Like, I don't, I don't even think about divorce. Like, divorce not an option. Like, that's a, like, divorce, like, what, what is that? I, I don't, I don't, like, it, what is that? I don't, I don't know what that is. Right? And it should be that same way with God. We can't be fickle with God. It can't be, hey, as long as you're blessing me, I'm good. Actually, what ends up happening is I don't see anything happen in my life. So I'm praying, I'm fasting, I need you to move, I need you to move. He moves, and I'm like, deuces. Up, oh, up, oh, you know what? I need you, I need you, I need you. Okay, great, thank you, deuces. You, you, you got to be committed. You got to decide Come hell or high water, I'm with God. So a quick sidebar, because I'm done, is have some pillars, okay? I have some things that I call pillars, all right? These are things that regardless what happens, it's not going to change. One of them is God is good. I don't care what happens in my life, God is good. And everything is seen through that standpoint. The second thing is all things work out for my good. And the third thing is my steps are ordered. The fourth thing is he'll never leave me nor forsake me. If I have these principles and these pillars, regardless what comes, I always see it through that lens. So I, I want to take a moment and have you, everyone bow their head. And I want you to have a conversation with you and God. And I want you to say, Lord, what are you speaking to me through this message? I thank you that you provided all things. What are my next steps? All the points are good, but the most important point was saved for last. You got to have a relationship with him.
Some of you, you're in relationship and things are good, and he's just calling you higher. He says, there's a deeper depth. There's a higher height. I want to show you more of my love. I want to spend more time with you. There are some of you who we had a relationship. Things were good, and then stuff got a little rocky. I got blessed. Things started going well, and I kind of forgotten about you. And he's drawing you close. He said, hey, come back. I'm sitting here arms wide open, ready to receive you. 